Hi, this is Ryan Thomas with East West back with another Composer Cloud tutorial. And today we'll be looking at the Soaring Strings demo that was featured in the second one minute Composer Cloud tip video. And uh, we're going to break it down section by section and take a look at the orchestration and MIDI programming techniques that were used to write this piece. Just like in the previous video, you'll find a link in the description that will take you to the list of all the patches that were used in this session. So I would encourage you to go ahead and have that patch list open while you watch the video. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look under the hood here. This opens with harp, celeste, violin shorts, that lovely little bassoon solo, adding some clarinet shorts, and then adding tambourine, French horn, and then the full brass section to crescendo into the next section that we will get to in just a moment. But let's go ahead and break down everything that's happening in this intro, starting with the strings. So we've just got the violas sitting on this one note and the violins are playing this uh, little staccato passage with the basses underneath rounding out things with those pizzicato hits. Everything goes to legato patches here to crescendo to the next part. And I should point out that I'm using the mod speed patch for my violin shorts. And I really love this patch. It's very versatile. You can actually emulate a slur to a staccato articulation just in this one patch by triggering the marcato note, which is the longest note in the patch, and alternating that with the staccatissimo, which is the shortest note in the patch, and it gives you this effect. Watch here again. Really useful patch. It actually sounds fairly convincing to my ears. So let's go ahead and move on to the woodwinds and see what they're doing. A lot of what's going on here is just part doublings with the strings. Uh, obviously you have this bassoon solo here, but then the clarinets are just doubling the violins there. And then the bass clarinet is uh, doubling the pizzicato basses. And then we have these little runs in the uh, piccolo, flutes, and clarinets. And I should note that I'm doing the same thing in the clarinet key switch patch that I'm doing in the violins, but obviously I'm using key switches to alternate between the shortest notes in the key switch patch with the longest of the short notes in the key switch patch. So again, it kind of gives you that slur to a staccato articulation. So let's go ahead and look at what's happening in the brass. And uh, let's go ahead and start where the clarinets come in, so you can kind of get a sense for how this is building. Here now we're adding the French horns, doubling those with the violins, building in with the trombones, and now the full brass into the crescendo. And uh, we just have these staccato notes in the trumpets to uh, just give us a little bit of extra energy right before the next section. And let's finally see how the harp and percussion are supporting all this. Uh, you notice that right now it just seems a little bit empty, just a little bit lacking in something. And uh, a lot of that space is actually being filled up by the harp and uh, the celeste. So the harp and the celeste are just adding a little bit of sparkle um, at the top there. And here's that tambourine. Timpani. And uh, this here is just a little uh, timpani flam, again, going into the next section, along with the harp run. So now we are into the meat of the piece, where the violins are now taking a melody. And uh, let's go ahead and look at that. So right now, violin one and two are in unison on the melody, with the viola and celli shorts outlining the chord, and pizzicato bass underneath rounding out the bottom. Uh, now we've split off violin one and two into melody and harmony, and now they are in octaves, with a celli counter melody. And now we're transitioning from pizzicato bass to legato bass. Moving on to the brass, uh, we're gonna start pretty much where the melody comes in. And we've got staccato French horns outlining the chord with uh, viola and celli, and a counter melody from the solo French horn, along with a solo trumpet now doubling melody with violin one. And it's important to note that 
Here we are cutting out the trumpet and the solo French horn in order to make some space in the orchestration for the counter melody in the celli. So right now we've just got staccato French horn, but now we're bringing in the trombones and the legato French horns for the conclusion of the melody. Much like with the brass, the woodwinds are mostly just doing doubling here. Uh, you've got clarinets doubling the violas and the celli. The oboe is on the melody with violin one and two, and bass clarinet is all the way down here with the uh, pizzicato string basses. So let's go ahead and hear what this sounds like. You have this little flute run here. Oboe adds some really nice texture and color to that melody. Now let's go ahead and stop here. We're doing a, a few things differently now. We've taken the clarinets off of the staccato notes with the violas and the celli. And we've actually put them down with the second violins in the lower octave of the melody. And we've also added flute to the higher octave of the melody with violin one. Uh, in addition to that, we are also adding the bassoon to help bring out that celli counter melody. So let's go ahead and hear what this sounds like. And that is a flute and piccolo run. So let's go ahead and see how the harp and percussion are helping to support all of this. And to do that, let's go ahead and start one bar before the melody comes in so that we can hear how the percussion section as well as the harp are helping us to transition to this part of the piece. Be listening for the cymbal swell, the, gl I'm, I'm going to call it a mark tree gliss from the various metals patch and symphonic orchestra, as well as the harp gliss. And right now we've just got tambourine kind of helping drive things along. And I'm going to bring in harp right here just to outline the chord and add a little bit of uh, texture, trying to keep things interesting. And now we're going to add some glockenspiel at the very top to kind of add some sparkle. And we're also going to have this temp uh, timpani here emphasizing that brass entrance. Uh, and then I have triggered the timpani roll here because this is the timpani key switch patch to get us into the last part of the piece. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't address what the choir is doing here, but uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about. I'm using uh, the very basic uh, ah patches here. If you want to know exactly what I'm using, again, just refer to that patch list. And you can see the part writing is pretty simple, but we're just using choir to help uh, keep things interesting and to add some more texture for this second part of the melody. So let's go ahead and start one bar before. They just kind of help fill things out a little bit. And now we are into the last part of the piece. And again, let's go ahead and start with the strings and then just uh, add everything section by section so that you can see how it's all fitting together. This is a pretty generic chord progression. Uh, we're starting off with the violin one and two, adding the celli and the violas, and then the basses. Let's add our brass. Again, mostly the brass is just doubling what's going on in the strings. So here we have the French horn one and two, doubling the cellos and the violas. And we bring in the full brass. And I should point out that I just opted to use the solo trumpet here uh, because I wanted to keep it a little bit more on the subtle side. And when I used more than one trumpet, it just got to be a little bit too much. Let's go ahead and add our woodwinds. Similar to the brass, uh, we're just doing a lot of doubling here. We do have a little flute solo, so be listening out for that. There's our flute. Uh, 
Now let's check out what percussion is doing. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. We're going to start off here with the mark tree, just to add some magic, some timpani and chime, and then a timpani roll going into the last note, with a little bit of celeste up at the top just to add some sparkle. Now I should point out that I am also using the Dynasty Odaiko here to supplement that timpani roll. I just needed something a little bit rumblier. I've actually applied the filter within the play engine to the Dynasty Odaiko, so all you're getting is the lowest frequencies of the instrument. And I'll, I'll go ahead and solo that for you just so you can hear what that sounds like on its own. It's a really nice effect. It's subtle, but it's, uh, I think in, in the context of this piece, it's, it's impactful. And uh, finally, let's go ahead and see what our choir is doing. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, I should note that I'm only using the women's choir because I did want to keep this fairly light and uh, magical. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about our reverb setup. If you saw the first video in this series, which is the Warhorns tutorial, um, I took you through all the reverbs that I'm using and, and how I have everything routed. Uh, and I also explained some of my rationale for why I choose the reverbs that I choose. So I would encourage you to go ahead and just take a look at the last uh, couple minutes of that video. But I am going to go ahead and recap what we're doing in this session. So for strings, I am using the South California Hall string specific impulse response from uh, East West Basses 2. And then for brass, we are using the South California Hall as well, but it is the brass specific impulse. For woodwinds, as well as our percussion, we are using the Northwest Hall. And we have added choir in this piece. So the choir reverb that I'm using is the Davies. Really lush uh, reverb, really nice. I like the slightly longer tail for the choir. And then we send everything to what I call the stage verb. This is just a really nice lexicon uh, emulation within spaces. And I also wanted to cover uh, mic positions. Unfortunately, I can't really give you any hard and fast rules just because the mic positions that I use will really depend on the kind of piece that I'm writing. So if I'm doing a more intimate orchestration, like something more along the lines of Silvestri, then I will have more of my close mics mixed in along with the main mics. Whereas if I'm doing like a, a battle scene, something really big and epic, I might actually turn these close mics pretty far down and then enable the surround mics. But for the most part, for almost all of my brass woodwinds and strings, I'm using a combination of the main mics and the close mics. But this is really going to be something that you kind of have to play around with yourself and uh, see what works for the piece that you're writing. So that pretty much covers everything. Uh, thank you so much for watching this, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.